to the Ghosts of Heart Hall. My name's Simon. And I'm McKelly. Thank you for joining us for episode 46 of our chapter by chapter book review of A Song of Ice and Fire by George Martin. Today we're discussing chapter 45 of A Game of Thrones. That's Ned 12. Oh, it's a good one. <laughs> As always, we'll chat about the chapter and try not to spoil any future plot points for you. And hopefully we'll provide you with some entertainment along the way. Ironically, you spoiled that just before you said you weren't going to spoil anything. You said it was I did. <laughs> uh, we'll summarize what's happened. We'll discuss our thoughts on it, provide some useful background, compare it to the television show, indulge in a little pedantry, and cover some mail. Be sure to check out the show notes. They provide some extra information about the characters and other things in this chapter. How are you? I'm all right. How are you doing? Uh, still isolated and locked down. Yeah. We... Uh... We are doing a double recording twice. We're not going to be putting these both out in the same week, but we are recording last week's episode and this episode just a day apart because we're trying to get a little bit in the hopper because we got some vacations coming up. So yeah, um, and it's still cold. We mentioned this last week, of course. <laughs> right. Our, re- our, our listeners won't know it's like, well, you know, because it's the day after, but it is bizarrely cold. It is. I've never known cold weather like this in June. No, no, never. Time. Usually, this time in June, it's so hot, my grass is already burnt out. Right. Yeah. But instead, I'm walking around in jeans and a sweatshirt, yeah. and it's, uh, it's very mid June. But. Uh, I've got back onto my bread making. I'm like, well, I've got a whole week of cold weather. I can make some bread. <laughs> and I guess I shouldn't make any ice cream because it's yeah, too exactly. cold for that. Although yeah. I'd still eat the ice cream anyway. So what am I talking about? Uh, you see, see, I'd eat the bread if it was, just wasn't too hot to make it. You know? <laughs> I would choose the... bread over ice cream any day. Yeah? Really? Would you? Yeah, yeah. That is such a fundamental difference between the two of us. Uh, there's very little as far as things to consume that I would choose over ice cream. It's, it's way down at the bottom of my list. <laughs> I, I've told you before, I, I have sensitive teeth. And so as a child, I didn't like ice cream because it hurt. Oh, yes. And so I never developed a taste for it. And now right. I'm like, I don't know what the big deal is about. I did and it still hurts that. my teeth. <laughs> it hasn't fixed that. <laughs> uh, speaking of British things, we finished the first season of Fleabag oh, last yeah? night. I tell you what, you know, I've told you before going through it, I just couldn't get into it. I couldn't really relate very well to the character. But the season finale of episode one changed that. She was vulnerable and relatable, and she was a much deeper character than what she had been for the first. Give, give me a tiny bit of the setup. Was it Was it her parents, her father's wedding? She went to the, uh, the, the sex show that her stepmother did like the art show it was like the it was all about her sex life and stuff and uh everything everything went wrong for her and was she asked to wait yes (laughs) yes she was (laughs) (laughs) yes Uh, that show was very good i thought so that episode you know has was enough to push me forward to season two yeah well i think you'll enjoy it it's good yeah, I think it? season two is probably probably better. I remember season two better than season one. All right. Good. I have some to look forward to then. All right. Well, we have a ton to get through today, so let's yes, get down to business. Quick recap of what Ned was up to last time we saw him. We don't have to go back very far because he's been in the last episode and the one before that. Because two episodes ago was a Ned chapter, and last chapter was Sansa, where she met with Ned. So. Right. He's, he's getting around that Ned. He's everywhere. Yeah, he is. Yeah. So, despite the bad leg, he's been running the kingdom while Robert hunts. Uh, while in charge, he stripped Gregor Clegane of his titles and dispatched Beric Dondari and Thoros of Mir and a contingent of his guard to bring him to justice. He's decided to send the girls back to Winterfell. King's, Land- King's Landing is no longer a safe place. And courtesy of an offhand comment by Sansa, he thinks that he's cracked the secret that led to Jon Arryn's death. McKelly, why don't we give them the summary? Okay, so Ned gets milk of the poppy from Grand Maester Pycelle and news of a raven from Tywin Lannister, unappreciative that his bannerman, Sir Gregor Clegane, is being hounded, ha, being hounded, <laughs> by men sent by Lord Stark. Ned tells him he doesn't care. The men seeking the mountain are under the king's banner. Tywin had better not interfere. 
You know, I, I think I wrote that sentence, but I realise how flawed it is now because you said Ned gets milk of the poppy from Grandmaster Picel and news of a raven from Tywin Lannister. So I've got visions of Tywin Lannister going, there's a raven. Of <laughs> 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 course, it was Grandmaster Picel that said there was a raven from Tywin Lannister. That's what I meant. Really. That's what was meant. Anyway, <laughs> moving on. Uh, Ned's next visitor is Littlefinger, Peter Littlefinger Baelish. He urges Ned to heal quickly. The realm needs him. The king won't be back for a while, even though half his party have come back. Ned almost confides what he's learned about the princes and princess, but resists, still not sure that he can trust Littlefinger. Ned gets his men to help him visit the Red Keep's Godswood, rarely used in the Citadel of the Southern Gods, so a quiet and peaceful place. He orders the guard doubled on the Tower of the Hand. Just got to get through the next three days until Sansa and Arya can be shipped north. Ned sends Fat Tom with a letter to the Queen. Cersei arrives several hours later. Ned's not too worried. His leg feels better. He, he feels he's comfortable in a godswood. Right. He can hang out there for days. Um, he confronts her with what he knows. She confesses, and not meekly to the incest and parentage of her children. But she does seem to deny the John Arryn murder. It's a little ambiguous what she says, but right. she doesn't confess to that. Yeah. She owns what she's done and feels no remorse. Ned tells her that when Robert returns, he'll lay the truth before him. Ned urges her to take the children and run, warning her that nowhere in Westeros is safe. Cersei complains that exile is a bitter cup, and Ned says it's sweeter than the one Tywin her father served to Rhaegar's children, and kinder than she deserves. She'll always be rich enough to be comfortable and have guards, which she's going to need against Robert's wrath. Cersei asks, what of my wrath, Lord Stark? She tells him that he made a mistake. The kingdom was his for the taking when he arrived in King's Landing after the Battle of the Trident, and the problem with, the play with playing the Game of Thrones is that there are only two possible outcomes. You win or you die. Oh. oh. Whew. This is a good one. This is the chapter we've all been waiting for, people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ned's got the ammo he needs, and he's yeah. confronting Cersei. Not necessarily, I mean, it's debatable whether that's a great idea, but it's what he's doing. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, the whole thing is a powder keg, and various fuses have been lit along the way. Yeah. You know, uh, Brands pushing out the whip, getting pushed out of the window. Cats uh, taking Tyrion. Yeah. Jamie's attacking Ned. But this, this is the. Yep. This is the big one. All right. So from the top, Ned gets his meds from Pycel, who Ned, like we, now see Pycel as a pure puppet of the Lannisters. Yeah, that's becoming rather apparent. The. Uh... The last chapter when he was so unabashedly pro Lannister was a pretty yeah. good tip off. Yeah. So, so everything Ned says to him, he's now filtering through the idea of whatever I say is going to reach Cersei's ears. So, yeah. I'm going to be careful what I say. Good idea. Yeah. But um, Ned has a good line. Pycelle, Pycelle, when giving him the milk of the poppy, tells him that sleep is the great healer. Ned says, I had hoped that was you. <laughs> even now, even Pycelle chuckles at that. <laughs> he did, yeah. yeah. I, I'm not sure. I mean, obviously, at this point in the chapter, the confrontation with Cersei hasn't happened. But if I was Ned, I would be hesitant to eat anything that had come from a Lannister's hand. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she, he, we assume, obviously, that she doesn't know yet what Ned knows, because the only way he figured it out was from something offhanded that his daughter said but still not a good idea to uh be consuming anything from a lannister or lannister loyalist at this point certainly not after this chapter anyway. right yes after this chapter out of the question yes but Pycelle reports that a raven has just arrived with news from tywin lannister which was what was trying to be explained in the uh chapter summary <laughs> Mea culpa. <laughs> he, yeah uh, Tywin is greatly wroth with the judgment against Sir Gregor, the mountain. Pycelle reminds him that, that this is uh, what Pycelle told him was going to happen. That uh, he would try to tell him at, during court that this was not a good idea. And of course... It's not really 
that much of a towering insight by Pycelle. <laughs> right. <laughs> so what you're telling me is Gregor Clegane has been at the command of Tywin Lannister ransacking villages in the Riverlands and when I send us send men to get him and behead him Tywin Lannister's not going to be happy. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> wow, deep. Thank you, <laughs> Wait, get out. You mean he's not going to be like, well, he's going to get what's coming to him. <laughs> but uh, so... Ned, when he says this, um, Ned thinks of Jory lying dead in his hands in the streets after Jamie's men, uh, after Jamie ordered his men to kill him, and he he thinks of the vengeance against the Lannisters that this brings. But if you remember in the chapter where he levied this sentence against Sir Gregor, he kept telling all the other uh, people who were speaking of vengeance like uh, mark piper and loris tyrell that this is not about vengeance it's about justice so he's he was saying it but he wasn't thinking it i guess yeah so ned says to pycelle that he's not worried about tywin's unhappiness if tywin interferes with dondarian's quest he'll have to answer to the king because they're flying under the king's banners uh Oh, the, and then he follows up with, the only thing that Robert enjoys more than hunting is making war on lords who, deny, who defy him. Yeah, he's, he said that, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure he entirely believes what he said, but he also knows that what he tells Pycelle is about to go directly to Cersei. So I, I think his, uh, his line that he thinks in his head is that he hopes that statement rattles her perfect teeth. So... Yeah, yeah, but but I don't think it's Robert's changing character. I think Robert really does like making war on lords who defy him. It's just that no lord has ever defied him who was his father-in-law and he owed six million golden dragons to. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good those, point. Those that's... are the problem areas here. Yeah, that's a potent combination. Yeah, if you were to come back from the hunt and Ned were to say, um, a lord has defied you, let's go. Robert would be like, all right, <laughs> who is it? Diamond <laughs> Lannister, wait a minute. Whoa. <laughs> you see, the thing so is this. I'm busy. Yeah. I got a lot to do. Yeah. <laughs> so Ned, after Pycelle leaves, Ned tries to think what John Arryn would have done with the secret that he's now discovered. But then he has a chilling thought. Maybe John Arryn did exactly what John Arryn would do, having discovered this secret, and that's how he ended up dead. Yeah. Right. So, so you can't. You, you got to be careful doing exactly what he did. Exactly. <laughs> I got to think what the wise man John Arryn would do, and how that ended up getting him killed. Yeah, but remember, uh, Varys back when Varys came and visited Ned in his chambers, he told Ned that John Arryn died because he was asking questions. Right. So, but of course, if John Arryn reached the same point that Ned did, his questions were over. Now he had answers. Right. So kind of what you do with those answers that's the more likely thing to get you killed. Yeah. Uh, Ned describes the secret as the sword that killed John Arryn and the one that will kill Robert. Which is an interesting thing. Is It says it's slower, but it'll def- definitely be the end of Robert too. I guess he means his mental, like he's he's going to go unhinged here when he discovers this. Yeah. Yeah. The three children you've raised were cuckoos. He's definitely going to go unhinged, but can he really be shocked that his wife in this incredibly loveless marriage has been unfaithful to him, you know? It's the nature of it, though. Yes, absolutely. And the fact that he's the king and he has basically unchecked power. Yeah, Yeah. so, so the whole realm will hear this story. He'll look like a fool and... Right. Yes, he'll be he'll be absolutely mortified. Yeah. But so after Pycelle leaves and, and Ned's having these thoughts, and Littlefinger pops in for a visit on his way to see Lady Tanda Stokeworth, who he was on his way to visit previously when he uh, stopped in to see Ned. Oh, I'm thinking she might be fictional, and it's just whatever he, he says that every time he visits <laughs> Ned. You know, oh, I'm on my way to Tanda Stokeworth. Oh yes, Stokeworth. Right. Sure. <laughs> So like Simon said in the uh, chapter summary, he warns Ned to heal quickly that the realm grows restive. Yeah, and I'd like to make a point here on the word restive. 
Restive is a fascinating word, I think, in the English language because it sounds like the opposite of what it is. Yeah, I agree. I I had to, you know, like on my uh, book, I can just hold down on a word and a definition will come up of it. And I had to make sure that I knew exactly what that word meant because it doesn't sound like yeah. what it does mean. Yeah. The, the other word I think like is like that is the word incorrigible. Yeah. Which is applied to a mischievous child who needs no encouragement. Right. They are incorrigible. Incorrigible. Yes. Yeah. A quiet, shy child would need to be, would, you'd hope they were encourageable. A mischievous child is an incorrigible. <laughs> there. Sorry. It's complicated. I got onto a word thing. Yeah. So Littlefinger reports that the free riders and sellswords are flocking to Casterly Rock. Yeah. Well, I would if I was them. War's in the air, and the Lannisters have got the deepest pockets. Yep. Definitely makes sense. And, if you uh, don't care about the fact they're horrible. Right, yeah, as long as you don't mind. And the one sellsword we know has done exactly that. He True. put his hand into the deepest pocket he could find around him, and that happened to be yeah. Tyrion Lannister. Um, Littlefinger also has news of Robert that um, the white heart that they were um, seeking to kill on the hunt uh, has been found dead, killed by wolves. So just a couple of sigils there to consider. The white heart is, of course, a stag, Yep. I.e. Baratheon, and was killed by wolves, the Starks, just just a sigil alert. So um, this made half of the hunting party turn around and come back home because the thing they were trying, hunting is already dead. But um, then Robert heard a uh, rumour of a monstrous boar. Um, if, you, if you're wondering about a sigil alert here, the only one I could find was House Craighall. They have a brindled boar as its sigil. They are from the Westerlands. Uh-huh. The Lannisters, uh, he says. Could be. It could be something. Yeah. 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 So um, he stuck around with half the party, but the rest have come back to King's Landing. So that's the people who've come back include Joffrey, the Hound, the Royces, Bale and Swan. They all got back this morning. Yeah, you remember Ned sent Robar Royce off to tell uh, King Robert the decision that he made to uh, basically have the mountain de-summited as... Uh, Littlefinger puts it. Oh, th- that's so. So, so that news did not make Robert come back. Yeah, that's a good point. So the I, idea, yeah, we, we, Robert's heard the news and he's like, "Yeah, I'll keep true." Hunting. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Unless Robar never made it, you know, unless the party split up before Robar got there. Right, I right, guess right. it's possible because we don't know that it was Robar Royce that came back. We know it was the Royces, but we don't know it was Robar. Right. Could have been his older brother and his dad. Yeah. So the, the, this news worries Ned somewhat because he knows what he's about to do to Cersei. Yeah. And to hear that the Hound and other uh, Lannister loyalists have come home is a little bit unfortunate because essentially both sides of this argument, uh, their forces are depleted. Yeah. Yeah. And Ned's down a few men and he sent some with Beric Dondarrion. Yeah, and now the Hound's coming back, who is yeah pretty handy with a sword. Yes, but of course the Lannisters are generally down Jamie and all his men. They they would normally be there on the Lannister side. Right, and but also a, a thing that will probably come up a few times in this episode is not the king. The king is not coming back. That makes this even more worrisome what he's about to do. Right, because because what he wants to do... Well, of course... Although, actually, it's difficult for him, because the whole point of his conversation with Cersei is to give her a warning so that she can flee, because he doesn't want her and her children's death on his hands. Yeah, I got some... So if the king had come back, then he's in like a, what do I do? Yeah, I've got some conflicted feelings about that. I guess we'll we'll get to it when we get to it, but it's, it's a risky proposition. Yeah, Littlefinger talks about the fact the Hound might not be as happy as Ned thinks, with the news of his brother's uh, uh, sentence to death, because Ned was like, "Well, they hate each other. Everyone could see that." But ne- but Littlefinger makes the point. But he was his to hate. You know, was didn't want anyone else hating him. It's uh, the Hound's job. Yeah, um, and uh, we know Littlefinger tells us that as soon as the Hound came back, he came back with Joffrey. He went straight to the Queen, so uh, he's going to be. Getting this news already, I would assume. Well, 
if if we're right that Robar Royce made it to the hunting party, he already knows it. Oh yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, it, you know, also Littlefinger mentions that. Clegane's keep and all the lands and incomes will go to Sandor, but he tells Ned, I wouldn't hold my water waiting for a thank you from the Hound on that one. Yeah. On his way out the door, Littlefinger notices the Book of Lineages. Uh, Ned sees him seeing it. They talk about it a little bit. Uh, Littlefinger jokes that it's probably his sleeping draft. Ned is right on the cusp of telling him what he knows, but he resists. He... Littlefinger has been helping him in some ways. He hid Cat. He found the Aaron staff that have been dispersed around King's Landing. Yeah. And he took him to the brothel. But he's arrogant. He ran away when Jamie came out and didn't really help. Yeah, that rankled uh, me too, if you recall. So he resists. He does not tell him. Yeah, so instead he just tells him it's what John Aaron was reading before he died. He's, the description says he did so to see what kind of reaction he would get from Littlefinger. And of course, Littlefinger just made a snarky quip about death must have been welcomed. I can't remember the exact line. But it made me wonder, is it possible that seeing that book and what it is, knowing that John Aaron was reading it before he died, and knowing the facts that he and Ned have uncovered together, is it possible he could have come to the conclusion at, um, like right then on the spot. Ned does say, like right in this section, Ned says he's too clever by half, and he has figured everything else out along the way faster than Ned has, so. Yeah, I mean, he's got every bit of evidence that Ned had. Yeah. He's not missing anything. Yeah. Um, unless, no, I mean, I guess there was the sort of conversations that Ned had with the with the Aryan staff, but Baelish might have had the same conversations. You right, know? that's true. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, that. It's a good point. You'd be disappointed in Littlefinger if he hadn't reached this conclusion. You think of him as being smarter than Ned. Yeah, he's the. He seems the kind of guy that would might be like, oh, oh, I think I know what's going on here. And given that he's got sort of, you know, he, I mean, he's not Varys, but he's got his own spies and lookouts. He might be at least suspicious of the possibility of an affair between. Uh, Cersei and Jamie anyway. Yeah, you would think that some of these small council members would be suspicious, especially Varys. Yeah. Isn't it his job to to know all the know secrets? Everything. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> no. but, but that's the thing, you see, I always think that Ned was a bit sort of dull for not getting to this conclusion quicker, but he doesn't know that. He doesn't know about Cersei and Jamie. We've known about that since the yeah. first Bran chapter, the second Bran chapter. Right. Um, and that makes it more obvious to us. But uh, but yeah, I agree. I think Varys and Littlefinger, I'd be surprised if they didn't at least hear rumours of the affair, which would then give credence to the idea that you should formulate from all the evidence swirling around. Right. But Littlefinger leaves. Uh, he's got that uh, dinner with the Stokeworths, or so he says. Mm-hmm. And Ned counts his friends in King's Landing and comes up with about zero. Which, <laughs> you know, Littlefinger did warn him not to trust anybody, including Littlefinger. So, yeah. hey, there's no one to... So it worked. He doesn't have anyone that he trusts. So Yeah. So, so he, he goes through them, Littlefinger, yeah, he doesn't trust him enough. Varys, he says he knows much and does little. Which yeah. I guess is what you want your spy master to do. You don't necessarily want your spy master to be making the decisions, but you just want him to be gathering the information. True. But we do know because of that uh, because of what Arya overheard, we do know he's plotting. And if you remember during that conversation with that Lord Varys had with Illyrio Mopatis, they were also worried about Ned finding bastards and what he'll do with the truth. And I think the line was if one hand can die, why not a second? You've danced this dance before. So now we have to wonder, now Ned has figured out the truth, if Varys finds out that Ned finds it, that Ned knows, is is he going to have some sort of reaction based on this uh, one hand can die, why can't a second? Yeah. Just adds another yeah, it's, layer. It's probably for that reason that Ned is not telling anybody Right, absolutely. You know, 
Ned is not told, as far as we can see, he's not told any of his servants, any of his staff. Yeah. He's just keeping it entirely to himself. Uh, so going through the rest of the people, he thinks about Pycelle, absolutely not. He's on the Lannister payroll. I wouldn't consider him a friend. Nope. Barristan Selmy, um, he thinks he's too old and rigid to be a confidant. You know, that, that he wouldn't have the the subtlety to keep a secret or, you know. And this is Ned Stark talking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think of all the the guys he's mentioned, Selmy would be my choice if I had to pick one. Because, like he said, he's rigid and uh, honor-bound and, and duty-bound, much like Ned. So his first instinct would be to protect the king, because that's what his role is. And we know he's a pretty trustworthy guy, at least I feel like he's a pretty trustworthy guy based on our interactions with him. So if I had to pick someone of these guys to confide in, I would probably pick Barristan Selmy. Yeah. But but Selmy stayed with the king on the hunt, right? So yeah, he didn't so come back. It's not an option but, right now. But 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 the what you just said is the reason I wouldn't trust him as a confidant because he is so loyal that Ned might have very good reasons for timing the moment when he tells Robert. For instance, right. he doesn't want Cersei and the children killed. And you think Barristan Selmy would not take that calculus into it he would simply go and tell Robert there and then. Hmm, and yeah. that's why I don't think he's the right man to confide in, even if he was here. Sure, yeah, that's that's possible. You'd think he'd at least be able to comprehend, we're going to wait and see if we can get the children out first. But maybe not. Maybe that's what he means by he's too old and rigid. But the one yeah, yeah. small council member he doesn't bring up is Robert's youngest brother, Renly Baratheon. He doesn't mention him here, so... Well, he said before that he doesn't quite know what to make of him, hasn't right. he? He said that before. Yeah. That he seems too jovial, I think is what he thinks of him. Yeah. Not serious enough. You would you would have to think well, I don't know. You'd have to you would you would like to think he'd have his brother's best interests at heart. But you never know. We don't know much about Renly yet. So um, Sansa and Arya are booked on a ship to back to the north, uh, leaving in three days. Um, Ned has been troubled by dreams of dead children. He remembers Rhaegar and Elia's children, Rhaenys and Egan, And he doesn't want the same for Joffrey, Marcella and Tommen. And, and you recall, we've had a few disputes between Robert and Ned over dead children. We had these two children here. That was a huge dispute that, that split them. Uh, they split up their friendship, and only uh, Lyanna's death brought them back together. And we saw the huge feud over what to do with Daenerys. Robert wanted Daenerys and the unborn child killed. Ned re- refused to be a part of it, threw down his hand badge, and stormed out. So, yeah. Ned do- does mention that Robert can be very forgiving. You know, I mean, if just listing a few of the people he's forgiven for fighting against him, uh, Barristan Selmy. Uh, Balan Greyjoy, Varys, and Grand Maester Pycelle all fought for the, uh, well, with the exception of the Greyjoys, all fought for um, the Targaryens, or were on the Targaryen side, and now are confidants of uh, uh, King Robert. Right. Ba- Balan Greyjoy, of course, of course, rebelled and tried to sort of uh, name himself a, a king, and the, they all went over there and quelled that rebellion. Right, and that's how Theon ended up in uh, Winterfell. Yeah, that reminds me a, a bit of Aegon the First Targaryen, Aegon the Conqueror. He kind of had the same code of conduct when it came to enemies. As you know, as long as they pledge fealty, he would offer them friendship, honors, right. land, office, all that. He just wanted, hey, you're you pledge your fealty to me, we're good. But. Ned cannot help but conclude this is just different. There is no way Robert's forgiving this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is, this is murderous rage time, and nothing's going to stop it. This might send um, out a witch hunt too to find out who knows. Like he he might be as suspicious as we are about whether Lord Varys knew of this ahead of time or not. You know. Yeah, because because that would be a betrayal. I mean, because obviously Varys doesn't want to unsettle the kingdom, but. Literally, the the crown 
in the event of Robert's death, the crown would be usurped by a non-Baratheon. Right. But Varys kept this secret. And yeah. that is a genuine betrayal of the king, I would say. Yeah, definitely. So he also, all the pieces are falling to, to fitting together here now, and he connects the dots to Bran's assassination. He obviously had reason to suspect the Lannisters. Now he's got motive. Put those things together, and he assumes Bran must have seen something and had to be silenced. And uh, yeah. I don't know if he necessarily knows that that had anything to do with Bran falling, but the assassination attempt is probably more what he's thinking about. Yeah, but but again, I mean, the only obvious conclusion is that he was he was pushed. He he saw something high up and was pushed from high up, and it didn't f- complete the job. That's why they sent the the assassin. Yeah, yeah, you could make that. Because, I mean, he's making all other kinds of leaps here. He he could make that one as well. But it's well. not that big of a leap because because Bran didn't see anything between the fall and the assassination attempt. He was stuck in bed. You know, that's true. Yeah, hadn't thought of that. Bran Good saw point. something between the last time someone saw him on two feet and the assassination attempt. Yeah. And most of that was him climbing that tower. Solid point, my friend. Yeah. But <laughs> So now uh, now Fat Tom is the captain of guard, and the, the description says, this gives Ned a vague disquiet. And I was like, vague? <laughs> vague disquiet? <laughs> If Tom is the best you've got left, you are in serious trouble, my friend. <laughs> I, I think it was, was it your penetry or was it just your observation about um, how uh, Tom must be incredibly fat for that to be the description to use to describe him because of how dumb <laughs> he right. seems to be. <laughs> for, for his fatness to outweigh his stupidity. Yes. yes. <laughs> So Ned gets his dwindling household guard to carry him, uh, help him to the God's Wood, um, and he sends Tom with a message for the Queen. Um, he's beginning to regret sending half his guard, his best swords, with Beric, but he does use, of the guards left, he tells them to double the guard on the Tower of the Hand. He doesn't want any uh, invasion of the Tower of the Hand. Yeah, we talked a little bit about that last episode, that, boy, he just keeps handing out his members of his staff and yeah. that that could be a problem I, mean, I, I think i think we said this last time too that some of them have come back i don't think they're still working for the gold cloak yeah i think they all came back but, but he just right. sent i think 20 of yeah. some of his best swords including and alan he only brought yeah he only brought 104 got killed three got killed yeah yeah it's something like it's that a slightly precarious position but Cersei shows up. He sits there for a while. And she makes him wait, and uh, but eventually she shows up, and she's dressed plainly, but she is sporting the bruise from Robert. And he also um, he notices for the first time in ages just how beautiful she is. So uh, yeah. yeah, but they, they talk about the bruise on her face. She admits that the king has hit her before, but never in the face, saying that Jamie would kill him if he if he had. Yeah. Um, which which kind of goes to Robert being. Uh, I was somewhat forgiving of Robert. I mean, l- I mean, let me first state, you should never hit a woman, obviously. But I was slightly forgiving of Robert because he was pushed. He was drunk. He's you know in an awful situation, an awful marriage with a woman he hates, kind of thing. But he waits until Jamie's out of town to hit her in the face. That suggests a little premeditation, which uh, sure makes his case. I hadn't thought us. about the premeditation part. That Jamie's out of town, I can whack you in the face. That's exactly. terrible. Yeah. Oh boy. So, um, she says he's a hundred times. Jamie is a hundred times Robert. She she technically refers to him as your friend. She says he's a hundred. Jamie is a hundred times your friend and it's every time she refers to robert in this chapter she refers to him as the association to ned like this your friend it's an interesting observation no not my husband or mm-hmm. whatever she okay re- yeah, yeah. <laughs> so ned he he's mercy bound and honor bound i guess to give her a heads up because he knows that Robert 
absolutely would kill her, the three kids, Jamie, I'm sure, as well. Yeah, but the real the real honor bound is how honor bound Ned is to tell Robert. I mean, yeah, he wasn't honor bound to tell her. He could have kept her a secret. He told her for mercy, but he's honor bound to tell Robert. And you know, Ned and Honor, they are yes, they go together. Sometimes they go together a little too much for my personal <laughs> yes <laughs> to the so detriment must... of himself. Yeah, for sure. Ned must figure the calculus of the of the rift that's going to be caused. So Robert's out of the picture right now. He's off hunting. This could spill into violence right now in King's Landing before Robert gets back. Absolutely. Yeah. So Ned is figuring that without Jamie and his men in town, he's got enough of an edge in the case of a fight to survive long enough to tell Robert the news. Which would make sense that he is a little worried that Sandor Clegane has just returned to King's Landing. Because he because that... definitely narrows the gap if there yeah. was one. Yeah. Now, if we're going to go, um, you know, uh, Joff's personal protector versus Ned's captain of guard, I'm going to have to put my money on the Lannisters on this one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But this is so incredibly dangerous because he believes that she is the one that killed Jon Arryn because he hasn't talk to Liza in a while. He doesn't know she's off her rocker. So he's still believing in the note that she sent to them that said Cersei right. killed John Aaron. And, and now again, like you said, he's got motive. They've got motive. They've yeah. got motive for Bran. They've got motive for John Aaron. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and actually that's right. In both cases he was given he was led to suspect them. Right. By by the note he was led to suspect the Lannisters for John Arryn's death, and by the dagger he was led to suspect the Lannisters for Bran's assassination. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And now he's been given a motive for both those things. Yeah. It's hard not to think, well, that's it. It must be true. Yeah. But is, is it wise? Okay. There's just, there's no hard return for the king right now. Maybe when you hear the king is on his way back or... Or something when you when you got a little more of a concrete return date for the king. Littlefinger made the joke that the king, if, if he had his preference, he would stay out there until both uh, Ned and Cersei died of old age. So you know, there's no sense that this guy really wants to get back to continue ruling his realm. It just seems maybe a little risky to be giving their her this kind of like open-ended he could be out there for another couple weeks we don't know just yeah. a, that's a lot of time to allow someone yeah. like cersei to, to scheme plot and plot and think you. yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah and the girls are still in town maybe at least wait till they're on the ship you know right but, but the thing is i think he thinks there's just a matter of days so if he waits the three days until the girls are on the ship then he's taken three days out of cersei's fleeing time and that might cost her, her life, you know. Yeah, maybe. Oof, that that's quite the. Oh yeah, that's I quite agree. the gamble to make right there. I agree. Yeah, I agree. So, um, he believes she killed John Aaron, and he confronts her with it, and she completely admits to the affair with Jamie. She completely admits that the children are hers, but she doesn't. She she snorts in derision at the idea that she killed John Aaron. She doesn't literally deny it, but she right. doesn't. Well, whilst giving all of this like list of crimes for which her life is forfeit, she doesn't admit to the one for killing John Aaron. So we're still left with ambiguity there. Yeah, absolutely. Her she makes some sort of joke like, uh, "Did you bring me here to tell me riddles?" When he says, "I know right, yeah. why John Aaron was killed," so yeah. everything else she's and, completely direct about, and this one she just kind of glosses over with a joke. Yeah, um, so. Ned, we find that, we discover that Ned, since Sansa's comment clued him in, he's been reading the book of uh, the great houses and descriptions of the lords and ladies more carefully. And it's it's finally confirmed everything to him. Because over the course of the last few hundred years, Baratheons and Lannisters have married multiple times. And every time a Baratheon has married a Lannister, be it male-female or female or female-male, the children have always looked like Baratheons. They've yep. always been dark haired until, and you know, every every one of them until Joffrey has been pure Baratheon. Yep. As I think, as the uh, line goes, the gold yields before the coal. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, and this is completely what John Iron meant when he said the seed is strong. So, um, but you know, 
the leap to Jamie being the father is not concrete. Like, there's no evidence that Jamie is the father. He had to make a bit of a leap there, as to my understanding. I can't think of an instance where it was obvious that these children are fathered by Jamie. And he, when she says, my brother is worth a hundred of your friend, he says, your brother or your lover? So he's the one that brings it up first. She says both. That's that's her answer. That's her admitting to it. Uh, but it, there's not a direct link to that I can think of no. to uh, to know yeah, that it because, was Jamie. Because it's, it's not like the Lannister look can't survive being half non-Lannister. Right. Exactly. It's just against Baratheons that they end up looking like Baratheons. But right. Lannisters with Tullys would look like Lannisters half the time, you know. Yeah. So either he just took a guess or he's uh, wiser than we're giving him credit for because that yeah, was quite the I, I guess I guess maybe it's it's simply it, it, I guess it was just a guess and she's thinking well he knows the the truth for which my life is forfeit he might as well know the rest you know Yeah good point yeah it's it's no worse now you know and and maybe his guess is comes from the fact that of all the people who she might get alone time with to actually have an affair, her brother is perhaps the one where he she might get that alone time. Yeah. With any other man, her servants, the King's Guard, would notice and report back. You know, Varys would notice and report back. But yeah. because he's her brother and a King's Guard, he has access to her. So maybe it was just that. You know? Yeah, it must be. Because it's kind of a an odd stretch to just assume those aren't Robert's children. It must be incest with your twin brother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but she fesses up straight away. She which does. all the more makes you think, I don't think she's responsible for John Ireland's death because why not confess to that one too? Because compounding all of this is she now confesses to the one she really amazingly confesses to. I mean, like, one I would never have expected to confess to. She tells him that she tried to kill Bran Stark. Yes. <laughs> if I was alone with Ned Stark, I would not tell him that in a million years. Even if his leg isn't a cast. <laughs> exactly. I mean, so... Yeah. So she was in a... She was in a revealing mood. Yeah, she, she was definitely in a confessing mood here. She says she did it to protect her children. Um, and I guess the, the logic is if Bran tells what he sees, then her kids would be in danger because she's having sex with her brother and uh, someone might get suspicious about the children. But there was no conversation about that. Like you recall in that chapter, it's not like one of them said, oh, we need to push him out because otherwise our children will be in danger. So they must no, have. But, but, yeah, but I mean, that's that's the consequence. You know? Yeah, yeah. If if that affair ever came to light, you wouldn't need the book of lineages. You'd immediately just assume. I mean, given how much Robert thought of Joffrey, he'd be delighted to discover. <laughs> that's <his>. true. <laughs> to even suspect he wasn't his, you'd know, be like, right, you out of here. Yeah, go to the wall. <laughs> but oh my, Joffrey at the wall. That was that'd be a sight I'd like to see. <laughs> but Ned wonders what Cat would do yes. if. It was John's life versus her children. And we got a little glimpse of that when John's saying goodbye to Bran and he's leaving and Kat says, John, and John turns and he's, she says, it should have been you. Well, I, so, so Ned asks Cersei how she never bore a Baratheon child, but she said that there was one pregnancy, but it was terminated. And for years, Robert's been so drunk that they've never actually had to have sex. And so she, she can't bear him to touch her anyway. So uh, he, Robert wakes up the next morning unaware of the fact that he didn't manage it. Right. So that's how she's got away with it. Yeah. And so then um, Ned says to her, I remember the Robert that ascended to the throne. He was, you know, the epitome of everything a woman could want. He was the king of kings. And why is it? that you hate him so bad. So many other women would have loved him with everything they had. And she tells a story that on her wedding night, while they were in the midst of their relations, uh, she referred, he referred to her as Liana. And 
Ned blue thinks of the yeah. blue roses that Rhaegar had given Lyanna that started all this in the first place. And it also answers a question that I think we had discussed at some point in the previous episodes, whether Robert and uh, Cersei had ever been happy. And apparently, ever since their wedding night, they had not been right. happy. <laughs> for, for about four hours. Yeah, then. maybe. <laughs> So Ned expresses pity for both of them, uh, but Cersei rejects his pity. Um, he tells her that uh, he she knows what he has he must do, and Cersei counters that a real man does what he wants to do, not what he must do. Yeah, uh, and she she then tries to use. I mean, she's she's come sort of like dressed in a way that makes her look attractive, and she she puts her hand on his knee at this point and says, you know, if Ned could keep the secret. Bridges could be built between the Lannisters and the Starks, you know. Uh, should something happen to Robert, Joffrey would need a good hand of the king. Ned could be that person. Uh, Robert, presumably, she's thinking, will drink himself into an early grave. So It's not too too far of a fetched thought there. Yeah. The problem is, is Joffrey's revolting. The first, thing, the first thing I would do if I was Ned, having discovered this news, is celebrate the fact that Joffrey uh, Baratheon will never be king. Yeah. Yeah, you'd have that thought. <laughs> Definitely yeah. would have that thought. Yeah. But she takes. Wait, so what you're telling me is I can carry on doing this crappy job for an even worse king. Okay, <laughs> right. Yeah, sure. <laughs> That's what I want. So then she takes things to the next level, and she she really starts to try and woo him. She puts his her hand on his thigh and then touches his face and says, "Your wife is a thousand leagues away." And Ned's response is. Did you make the same offer to John Aaron? And whack! She slaps, she slaps him across him. the face. Mm-hmm. And he he copies her line from when Robert hit her, says, I'll wear that like a badge of honor. Yeah, throws that back in her face there. And then she gets angry, as, as you might imagine. And uh, yes. she accuses him of being just like everybody else. And she says, you have a bastard. I've seen him with my own eyes. Well, who was the mother? Was it a, some serving wench? Or was it the grieving sister of Sir Arthur Dane, Ashara? That she threw herself into the sea? Was it because you killed her brother? Or was it because you took her took a son from her? All things we speculated about. Yeah, and she so mockingly yes. calls him the Honorable Lord Eddard. But, you know, if he wasn't so honorable he might not be here in this situation, which would leave her to being completely blindsided and, you know, letting Robert do whatever he's going to do to her and her brother and her kids. And Ned counters that, you know, so she's saying that he's just like all the other lords of the kingdom, but he counters saying he's not like Jamie, he's not like Robert, because he would never kill children. That's why they're having this conversation. He doesn't want their blood on his hands. Yeah. So <laughs> she needs to go. She needs to go to Essos, uh, not not stay on Westeros. She needs to use her family wealth to set herself up and pay for guards for the rest of her life because Robert will pursue her till the end of her days. Yes. Yeah, that's that's a legit legit thought there. She yeah. says not even the free cities. Like go go to the free cities, go further than the free cities, go to the port of Ibn or even to the summer isles. So uh yeah. I can see Cersei as a Khaleesi. <laughs> yeah. She would I'm not sure she'd be down with, you know, the daily life of a Dothraki, but... <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure not. So, yeah, I just... I get where he's coming from. You know, obviously, I'm with him. I don't want to see children killed either, but I'm just not quite sure of the strategy here. I, I don't know that this plan is realistic. Does he really think that the Lannisters of Casterly Rock are just going to flee... By him saying, I'm going to tell the king about this. It just, it's an incredibly dangerous game that he's playing here. And like I said before, I think he's giving too much time to the Lannisters of Cersei yeah. to plan here. But 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 the plan he's put before her is, it is in many ways, maybe it's just him. Maybe he just doesn't have the imagination to come up with other alternatives. He is giving her the option to flee and save her life, and she could take that. It would save her life and that of her children. She could. That's my point, is 
I don't know that it's realistic. I don't know that it's in the Lannisters of Casterly Rock to just flee Westeros because they're being threatened. And I feel like he should know that. But like you said, maybe he, maybe he's not creative enough to see other options here. So she gets threatening. She she asks what of her wrath. Um... Yeah, exactly. What of her wrath? I mean, we've we saw what Jamie's wrath did. Ended up with three of Stark's men dead. That wrath is going to be nothing compared to Cersei's wrath if she decides to fight and not flee. Right. Yeah. Because and especially because of the what underpinned it. The underpinning of Jamie's was Tyrion being taken captive. The underpinning of Cersei's is, you're going to be dead. You and, and all your children, children to be yeah. dead, <laughs> yeah. right? <laughs> so she's got something to really fight for there. Yeah, and that's when she, she te- laughs at yeah. him and says, "You should have taken the throne because after the sack of King's Landing, Jamie was sitting on the throne. Ned arrived with all his men, kicked Jamie off the throne, and he could have claimed the throne by just sitting down. At least." His According to Cersei's story, he could have just pronounced himself the new king of Westeros. And, you know, if you remember back before, uh, Robert had even said, you should have been the king. You would have made a better king than me. Uh, yeah. So, but he says, Ned says, this is not, it was not a mistake. I've made many mistakes. That was not one of them. And she disagrees. Because she says, you know, the whole name of the book here. If you play the Game of Thrones, you win or you die. There is that's no right. ground. Yeah, and that's not a, a very veiled threat there. He's got 20 less <laughs> guards. Most of the good ones are gone. Fat Tom's in charge. He's surrounded by Lannisters. There's no king in sight. And his kids aren't even on the boat back north yet. So It also perhaps goes to... It also perhaps constitutes a response by her. She's playing the Game of Thrones. She is not accepting middle ground. Yeah, she'll she'll risk their lives to stay there. That's a good point. Maybe is that maybe that's what she's saying too. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Well, fantastic stuff. Yeah, it's really good stuff. It's one of the one of the big moments we've been waiting for. This confrontation right here. So background, what you got? So one of the things that Cersei says when Ned confronts her about Jaime, she says, "Yeah." Jamie and I are intimate together, and why not? The Targaryens have been doing it for 300 years. Yeah, that that is mostly true, but some factors need to be considered first here. So, first off, not all Targaryen marriages were smiled upon by the faith in the realm. Even Aegon the Conqueror and his sister wives weren't completely accepted. At best... Right, and, and, and they encouraged people to be okay with their incestuous relationship by having dragons. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> you want to turn a blind eye to this or do you want to get fried? Oh, <laughs> suddenly it doesn't seem so bad. At best, the High Septon ignored the fact in the name of peace and dragons. But uh, but Aegon's son Aenys, the second king of Westeros, wed his son and daughter to each other and that began the Faith Militant Uprising, which lasted through his and his brother Magor's reign. And it wasn't until Aenys' son Jaehaerys' rule that there was peace between the crown and the faith. And Jaehaerys did marry his younger sister Alysanne, despite protests from their mother Alyssa Valerian and stepfather Rogar Baratheon for fear of backlash for the incestuous relationship. Instead, King Jaehaerys worked out the doctrine of exceptionalism with the faith of the seven in order, in order for them to tolerate the continued practice of incestuous marriage by the Targaryens. This is the gist of the, doct- of the doctrine, basically. The laws laid down by the seven decree that incest was an abomination. The doctrine agrees with this. But with one caveat, the Targaryens were not like others, being the only dragon riders since the Doom of Valeria. In addition... Unlike the Faith of the Seven, they did not get their roots in Andalos, which is in kind of northwestern Essos, where the Andals are from. Rather, their roots come from Valeria with different laws and traditions, and the Targaryens wed brother to sister as the Valerians had always done. As the gods made them this way, it was not for men to judge. 
A side note, in Westeros, it's not considered incest to marry cousins. Cersei's parents, in fact, Tywin and Joanna, were first cousins. Only parents to kids and sibling to sibling are the completely ruled out. Yeah, so I think... I think Cersei's trying to justify it to herself. Right. I don't think she could legitimately make a case to the people. Yes. I don't think, let's say she could get rid of Robert and Ned and, you know, maybe, you know, Joffrey's too young so she assumes the throne and marries Jaime. I don't think that's going to work, really. Yeah, she'd need an awfully big but dragon. But she can justify it to herself. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you have a dragon behind you, people are definitely going to be more willing to play ball so one of the places that ned suggests fleeing to is the port of ibn ibn is the main city on the island nation of ibn which is located in the shivering sea the polar sea north of essos the ibanese are frequently referred to as the men of ib the nation of ibn <laughs> consists of several islands and settlements on the mainland of essos the largest island is ib which contains the port there are some smaller islands south of Ib in the Bay of Wales and one to the north. According to George Martin, if you visualise Westeros as Britain and the eastern continent as mainland Europe, Ibn is kind of where Finland would be. When people visit Ib, they are restricted to the harbour and port of Ib and they can only venture beyond the city in the company of an Ibanese host, which is rare. They were once ruled by a god-king until the doom of Valyria, and are now ruled by, a sh- by, the, by the Shadow Council, whose members are chosen by the Thousand, an assembly of various powerful people, similar to the magisters of the three cities. The Ibanese are mostly known as whalers, and are one of the few peoples to sail the eastern waters of the Shivering Sea. That, um, that behaviour of not allowing foreigners to visit, um, I think that was quite common in uh, China when the Europeans reached China. When the Europeans reached China, they didn't allow the Europeans to walk around freely. They, they, they kept them very carefully constrained to certain places. So they did, I guess, to keep them from learning too much uh, useful information against them, perhaps. Huh. Interesting. I did not know that. So, comparison with the television show, most of the early half of this chapter is completely ignored. Ned making plans for the girls to leave, meeting with Littlefinger, getting milk of the poppy from Pycelle. None of that happens. We go straight to the scene with Cersei. It's broadly maintained. It's just in a plaza in King's Landing, not in the Godswood. And having been show-oriented for many years, you know, I read, I read, last read this book before I watched the show. So, um... It's been a long time, and so my my thinking is kind of show thinking, and so it's interesting to read the book and have uh, some notions dislodged. Yeah, the idea of a God's Wood in King's Landing is kind of a surprise to me. I've completely forgotten that it even existed. So, uh, <laughs> the episode of the show, this episode of the show, sort of going to the importance of this scene, was called "You Win or You Die." That's right. That's what happens when you play the Game of Thrones. Yeah. So pedantry. Yep. It's pedantry corner time. It is. We haven't had any decent pedantry for a while, but we've we've mentioned this before, but couldn't John Arryn have come up with something just a tiny bit less cryptic for his dying words? Yeah. For instance, let me <laughs> let me give you an example. Joffrey is Jamie's son. I believe that's the same amount of words as yeah. <laughs> the seed is strong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, maybe he just wanted to give them something to unravel, yeah. you know, mystery to, exactly. to solve. Exactly. You you did a escape room, didn't you? Yes. Yes, I've done several. It would have been really boring if it was just a big key. So <laughs> this key opens <laughs> right. the door. Yeah. Key hanging on a chain. <laughs> Do you know I've done, journey. I've done like four escape rooms and I have never successfully gotten out of one. I mean, I have when time ran out. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not doing this episode from an escape room. <laughs> I have never successfully gotten out of an escape room before the time ran out. I, I blame seeing it on you on this video. Seeing you on this video, you could actually be in an escape. I could. Yeah, <laughs> it's featureless. There's nothing there. Uh, um, I blame it on the company that I'm with every time. That's got to be it. It yeah, can't be me. <laughs> Was one of the challenges to get out of the escape room to record 50 episodes of a podcast? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm still in there. Mm-hmm. So news and notes. So 
please send us in your questions for the 50th episode. We're going to do a 50th episode special, probably like a midweek thing, not not a chapter related one. Uh, but send us questions and we'll answer questions. They can be about anything. They can be about Game of Thrones. They can be about A Song of Ice and Fire. They can be about our personal lives. The world at large. The, the world at large, yes. It's what we think about the world at large. Um, just send them in. We will read them out. You can ask for them to be anonymous if you want. Um, um, we'll do a little q and I think that'll be fun. Yeah. So please send, send us in. questions. Send them in or we'll just make them up. <laughs> You won't know the difference. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so shall we draw some conclusions here? Yeah. So Ned held all the cards, and that honor of his caused him to share them. And if he didn't, he could almost certainly have crushed both Cersei and the Lannisters by, yeah. you know, surprise, catching them off guard. Yeah. But he still has one trump card, which he hasn't yet played. Uh, Jamie's gone. The Lannisters are depleted, and apart from Cersei, leaderless. Yeah. Uh, yep. The Starks are depleted too, but their leader is hobbling around, but very much, in, very much present. Yeah, I'm still a bit concerned about the uh, Hound versus Fat Tom matchup, though. <laughs> I don't think that's going to go yeah. in Ned's favor very well. Maybe, maybe you target Joffrey because. The Hound is his bodyguard, so if you could perhaps tie him up with protecting Joffrey somehow. Maybe. That would go a bit against um, the whole thing he's trying to do here of keep the children safe, but... Yeah, but you're doing it... Eh, yeah, I'll take your point. Yeah, if Jamie had been in town, though, then this... I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they tried to kill Ned tonight. You know, like... Yeah, yeah. If, if Jamie had been in town... Ned should have got on the boat with the girls and sent a raven from the boat. Yes, there you go. With the news. <laughs> towing towing a banner behind it like uh, all those airplanes at the beach. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he... And the banner would read, the seed is strong. <laughs> and no one would know. <laughs> no one would know. But it's such a good clue. Why can't anyone figure this out? <laughs> yeah, he's still, even with Jamie out of the picture at the moment he is still in a considerable amount of danger because yeah it's it's sort of a matter of time a matter of how long it takes robert to get back that's the key yeah one of two things is going to happen cersei is going to pack up and hightail it out of there quick as you like or she's going to plan to silence ned yeah that's before robert can hear the news right and depending how long it's going to take for Robert to get back, might have, if she knew Robert was on his way back, he is going to be there in the morning, she might hightail it out of there. If she knows he's not going to be back for a couple of weeks, there's no urgency to to get a jump on fleeing. Right. But of course, of course, now you have no idea how long he's going to be gone because the, the, the other half of the party left and left him hunting. Maybe he gets bored after 10 more minutes and he's right behind them. Maybe they catch the boar the next day. Right. And he's one day behind them. Yeah. Maybe it takes two more weeks and it, he's gone for weeks. There's no way to know how long he's going to be from this point onwards. Yep. You had a good question about Stannis. Yeah, well, I mean, let's assume the Lannisters killed John Arryn because he found out this secret. Let's assume the Lannisters would like to kill Ned Stark because they, he's found out this secret. They have reason to suspect that Stannis Baratheon knows this secret too. Yeah. He was following this... John Aaron around, as best we could tell. Right. Now, it's possible he could be, like, kind of in the Littlefinger role, where, you know, going along and helping to to figure out details, but not necessarily know all the information. But you'd imagine that, I mean, I think they were they were compadres, they were talking. I think it, what John knew, Stannis knew. Yeah, it's, it so seems I'm very just possible. Saying, if this is, I mean, obviously, this is a... Now, but here's the interesting thing. You've made this point earlier in the chapter. The secret is that they are not Robert's children. Yeah. The extra piece of information that Cersei volunteered is that they're Jamie's. Yes. I don't think there's any way for John Arryn and Stannis to have come to that conclusion without asking Cersei themselves. And I don't think that happened because of the way she reacted when Ned confronted her with killing John Arryn. Yeah. She did not seem to think that she'd done that. Yeah. It was... Yeah, it definitely is curious 
why she didn't confess to that if she was involved. Right. So, you asked the question before, could Littlefinger have figured all this out too? I think he could. I think he could and should and would. Yeah. And it'll be fascinating to see how that affects things if he has figured it out. Yeah. And like I said, just getting back to the point I made at the end of the general discussion, is all this for benefit? I know he's trying to save the children, but that would require her to do the right thing, to save the children, to get out of Dodge, to, to flee. I don't know if it's in the Lannisters to do such a thing, so I just don't know if there's any point to what but, he's but, just done. Uh, yeah, yeah. And with that in mind, Ned has absolutely risked his own daughter's lives to save Cersei's children's lives. Yeah, yeah. He's definitely because put he, them at risk. And he's the he's one that asked the question, what would I do if it were someone else's children versus my own children? Well, in this case, we just saw he, he went and put his own children in danger to help save the other children. And let's not forget one last thing. Uh, Varys and Lyrium Apatis, they're plotting something and there was reference to killing a hand if he found out information that he just found out. So we'll have to keep an eye on if anything yep. happens with that. Yep, indeed. All right. Well, I think we're done. Uh, yeah, so, I think so. As always, you can reach us at ghost.harrenhall at gmail.com and follow us on Twitter at Ghost Harren Hall, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And if you wouldn't mind going out there and helping us get the word out by leaving us a review on iTunes or Podchaser.com or Google Podcasts or Apple Podcasts, that really would help us out. We would so greatly appreciate that. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye. Bye.